So I'm reading through comments in our recent Pearson Work Holding Q&A about some of my equipment buying regrets. Uh, good feedback, good comments, and I've got more stuff I'd like to talk about. Stick around, it might be beneficial to you. Let's head in the conference room. So let's talk about some things that I did buy that I wasn't sure I was making the right decision, but it actually turned out great and I would still have made the same decision today knowing now or knowing then what I'd know now. So the first thing is going to be not buying super speed machines. Now the VF2 SS is I think by far Haas's most popular machine. Uh, seems like every other guy that I follow on Instagram has a VF2 SS. It's a great machine. We just purchased our first one. But my decision not going with super speed was that um, I, I was kind of gun shy about the high pitch ball screws because of the, the Super Mini Mill 2. And you have like a medium ball pitch with the VF series and then a, a finer ball pitch would be the Haas uh, VM, the mold making series machine. So. I liked, I was okay with the slower rapids, the slower max feed rates. Um, I think it's like 650 or 600 inches a minute cutting that we do now on our non SS machines. SS machines go 833. We've never programmed our, our super speed machines. We have two of them. Um, we've never programmed them to anywhere near 833 inches a minute. I think on our VF4 SS, which I purchased that because of the side mount tool changer and the 12,000 RPM spindle, not the table rapids or speeds. Um, I think the fastest we program that is about six, yeah, 600 uh, inches a minute. So for the price of a super speed machine, I've been saving those thousands of dollars each time across one, two, three, four, five, five standard VF machines. And um, I've, I've been able to reinvest the difference in that into new equipment. So. Uh, you actually get almost a free machine if you cut back on the options that you need. Like uh, only half of our machines have probes. I'd say, yeah, three out of six machines have probes. So we've taken that $55, $6,000 per package and uh, allotted that to different equipment purchases. And um, it's just a strategy that's paid off. Now, I know that some people would say, well, Jay, an 8,100 RPM spindle is significantly slower than a 12,000 RPM spindle. Aren't you giving up some speed? True, in, in a lean approach, speed is actually not at the forefront of improvements. When we make improvements, we have four things that we measure it against. Number one, is this safer, as safe, or less safe? If anything is less, we don't, we don't push it forward as an improvement. So we go safety, then we go quality. Is it yielding equal quality or better quality? Simplicity is the third thing. Is this more simple or equally simple as the previous one? And then speed. So there's other things that we weigh first. When you look at start to finish delivery of, um, if you're a job shop, when the PO comes in to when you issue the invoice, what is the total processing time? A lot of times it's, Hardly ever is it tied specifically to machine time itself. Now, when you get into the thousands, yes, every tool change matters, uh, every RPM bump matters, uh, rapids matter, yes. But for us, we work in smaller batches. We don't overproduce. That's another lean principle. And so we're okay with giving up those extra 4,000 RPM. From a, a programming standpoint, we cut lots of stainless, lots of cast iron, lots of steel. And if I remember correctly, if you're spinning a half inch end mill at about 800 surface, which I think is like an average, uh, it's a little over 6,000, maybe 6,100 RPM on that spindle. Uh, check my math, but I'm pretty sure. So, you know, even with our standard machines that only go up to 8,100, 6,100 is well inside the, uh, the spindle range. And also, if you were to look at a graph of horsepower and torque, you don't get a lot of torque at those higher, you know, uh, five digit RPMs. So yeah, you can actually have a higher metal removal rate 
at six, seven, 8,000 RPM than you can at 12,000 RPM. Now there's exceptions to this, of course, but uh, yeah, no, I don't regret not getting super speed machines. Lesson learned, early on, pinching pennies is gonna pay dividends as you reinvest every dollar back into your company. Now, my next no regret purchase that I was on the fence about, I was so agonizing for, for months and months, was purchasing our rotary screw compressor. Now it's made by Polar. They're a family owned business in Ohio. I wanna say maybe it's Toledo or Dayton. Um, but uh, we jumped from a eight or $900 80 gallon Lowe's compressor up to like, I wanna say it was like 6,000 out the door, six or 7,000, it's been many years, but it, it was, that's a huge jump to go from $800 to call it $6,000. Man, I, <laughs> I love our rotary screw compressor. And you know why? Because I don't even know it's around. Piston compressors are so loud, they're harsh when they turn on and, turn on and off. Yeah, and off because they're, they, they have a blow off valve. It's just jarring. Um, it, there's a, there's a, a, a power spike when they turn on. The rotaries, ours is a, a variable speed drive. Um, it idles, so once you turn it on, which is where a lot of the power draw is, it ramps up that speed, then starts compressing. Then when you reach maximum uh, PSI output, then it idles for a little bit before it completely shuts off. If we have a large air consumption, then it ramps back up quietly. Man, I love it. It's almost zero maintenance. Now, once a year, we change the filters and the oil, but yeah, it's one of those things that I would never uh, start a shop or recommend anyone get a piston style pump. I mean, of course, you gotta make do with mo what money you have, but it's night and day. Now, the nice strategy that I did was I contacted Polar and I said, look, um, the five and a half horsepower uh, motor is okay for now, but I got plans to grow this company. The 10 horsepower motor is, is like, it seems like overkill. And I don't know if I'll ever do that, uh, or get to that point. What they did is they shipped it to me and they programmed the PLC for five horsepower. So it's not even running at its full capacity. Um, they have great customer support. So when we do expand, like when we moved into this building, we bumped that five horsepower up to seven and a half. When we move to our next location in about three or four months, uh, we will bump that to the full 10 horsepower. So the compressor is tuned for our needs. So we're not, you know, just ramping up and getting a ton of air. Then it sits and we have this cycle time. That's just, this duty cycle is turning on and off we can set it to exactly our needs. I absolutely love it. Lesson learned, don't hesitate in reaching out to manufacturers for the inside details on their products. And my final uh, no regrets purchase would have to be our automatic saw. Now I started out with, uh, boy, I think I owned three manual saws. Um, I can't even remember the brands, but I think when I first bought my first one, it was 600 bucks. And today's pricing, they're like 12, 15, 18, maybe $2,000. But sawing from a lean perspective is over processing. If you could take a bar of material and just put it in a, in a machine and, it, and that machine runs and spits out finished parts, much like a bar fed lathe or a dual spindle lathe, uh, that's ideal. But when you take a 12 foot bar of material and you're sawing a bunch of pieces, which then go into a mill, and uh, that's you're, you're you're processing the material, and it's not yet adding value. It's preparatory when you cut off a part and then put it in a mill or a vise or a pallet. Um, so an auto saw, uh, it's I shopped around and I paid about twenty thousand dollars for a new hem saw. Again, another family-owned business. It's a very simple device. So I looked at some of the, the like the Duals and the Cosens and um, maybe one other brand, um, a few international brands, but they had beautiful touchscreen displays. 
if we're doing a simple thing like sawing, my approach is to have it as simple as possible. So it just has a basic interface. It has a crank at the back where you set on a counter the length and you program how many pieces you want and it just runs, runs, runs. Um, I have not regretted that. If I spent 20,000 on this simple automatic saw, the next digital saw up would cost about 30 to 35,000 depending on the brand. And um, so I saved money that way on going with a, just a, it's a, it's a PLC based saw and it just cuts material. It takes the operator out of doing the dumb, dirty, dangerous work and puts them in higher brain power work. So we're not wasting brain power, lean waste number eight. And so I would always go with an auto saw without any hesitation or any regrets. Lesson learned. Don't hesitate in buying equipment that will free people up to use their brains for higher end tasks. Hey, uh, consider doing a favor to the machinist community. Add your successes and failures in the comments section down below so we learn from each other. That's what we're here to do. If you haven't done so, consider subscribing because we're always gonna put out content that benefits you, the machinist community. So until next time, go innovate your production.